Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're going through tips before exams. This is designing an experiment. It's suitable for Unit 6 Biology, the 8 marker question, which is usually question 4. And sometimes this question could be 10 marks. I have included 3 examples. But first off, I know many of you watch our channel, but we need more subscribers. So please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We need more numbers in order to grow together. As we progress to the next exam seasons, there is going to be more content than what we have right now. So please do subscribe so that the channel can grow. I am counting on you. In this video, I'm going to cover what you need to know before you attempt any question. I will look at the preliminary practical work, designing the experiment, presenting and interpreting results, as well as the included examples. The first part is before you attempt. Here you need to fully understand the question, identify the main aim of the experiment, in this case, I always recommend the students underline when they're reading. You need to determine the dependent variable as well as the independent variable. This is because some students do mix them up. You need to clearly understand the relationship between the dependent and the independent variables. And you also need to determine which ones are the control variables. Because remember, usually they give like four marks to the control variables, uh, one for each variable, and then two marks for how you're going to control those variables. For example, you can say control temperature, one mark, using a water breath, the second mark, and then pH, one mark, using a buffer, one mark. So those could be four marks for two variables and how to control them. So if you didn't identify any variables, then you're going to lose some marks. And then you have to plan your answer. Here you could do by outlining the steps of the experiment to help you structure your response carefully. And also you have to include any safety measures that you use during the experimentation. Moving on to the preliminary practical work. This is very important. It's usually a three mark question. Here you have to know how you're going to vary the independent variable. For example, if they're talking about the effect of a concentration maybe of glucose on some process, you have to find ways of diluting the concentration of glucose, but what concentrations are you going to use? This is determining how you're going to vary the independent variable and then how you're going to measure the dependent variable. Remember the dependent variable gives you the results, so you have to find out how you're going to measure it. You have to find out how much time you need for the experiment because this time should be important for you to gather the required results. And then you have to determine the conditions for the organisms, like which organism are you going to use, what species is it, what age, what mass, what gender, the sample size, and so on. Usually with biological experiments, we work with organisms, so you have to do that determination for the organism. You also have to determine the optimum conditions for the experiment. I'm talking about other conditions other than the independent variable because the independent variable is going to be varied, but for the other conditions that you have to keep constant or to maintain, you need to choose the optimum conditions so that that does not affect the rate of reaction or the specific process you're trying to study. These could be temperature, pH, carbon dioxide concentration, and so on. You also have to find out how variables can be controlled, like I talked about this already, Temperature could be using a water bath, pH using a buffer, light intensity, and so on. And then you have to look at the safety and ethical considerations, potential hazards, as well as ethical issues. Next, we go to designing an experiment. Here, marks are going to be awarded depending on the content you've included, as well as the way you have framed or phrased your writing. Make sure to write in complete sentences. So here you have to stay the independent variable as well as the dependent variable. You need to write about how the independent variable is going to be varied. You need to write about the conditions of the organism used. These are going to be the biotic ones, meaning concerning the organism used. These could be age, mass, gender, and so on. Then you need to describe how the dependent variable is going to be measured. You need to include the experimental time. This means you have to specify the actual time you're going to carry out the experiment for. Then you need to repeat the experiment at all values these are values of the independent variable and obtain the mean. This means for every part of the independent variable you've varied, you get to repeat that experiment so that mean values are the ones used in the interpretation. Also, you have to state at least two control variables and how they're going to be controlled. These are the abiotic variables like temperature, pH, light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, wavelength, and so on. And then if the same organism is used for all varied values of the independent variable, then you have to allow the organism to acclimatize before you measure for the next change. If microorganisms are involved, then you have to culture under aseptic conditions. 
And if this is a 10 mark question, remember, 2 marks could be awarded based on the content written, the clarity, transition, as well as writing in full sentences. This is basically even if it's an 8 mark question, you have to write in full sentences. You should never list. I'm going to presenting results and interpreting them. You have to record your results in a table with suitable labels and units. And you have to include columns for repeat experiments as well as calculated means. You have to remember that the independent variable is to be put on the left. This is of the table and the dependent variable is going to be to the right. Also, you need to use mean values to draw the suitable graph. It could be a scatter line graph or it could be a bar graph. This graph should also have labels and units. And remember, for the graph, the independent variable should be on the x-axis and the dependent variable should be on the y-axis. Also remember, a bar graph is drawn if there is no gradation in the independent variable, while a line graph is drawn when the independent variable shows gradation. You also need to use a suitable statistical test in order to establish significance of the results. Now I'm moving on to the examples. The first one is investigate the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis in a pond weed. Since this is a pond weed, which is a water plant, we're going to set up our experiment using water. And since this is photosynthesis, we have to provide carbon dioxide using sodium hydrogen carbonate. To begin, I can say the independent variable is light intensity and the dependent variable is the volume of oxygen produced per time. In this experiment, the same pond weed should be used at all varied light intensities. This ensures consistency. However, we need to allow the plant time to acclimatize to the new conditions before we measure. We need to place the pond weed in the beaker filled with water and add sodium hydrogen carbonate in excess. I'm making this in excess so that the concentration of carbon dioxide does not limit the rate of photosynthesis. Now, when I say in excess, it means it has to be in a measurable excess. So we know the quantity, but we know it's in excess. This means for every experimental setup we have, or for every light intensity we change, we are going to put the same amount of sodium hydrogen carbonate, but it's going to be excess or more than required for the time of the experiment. Place the beaker in a dark room to prevent interference from other light sources. Position a lamp at a fixed position from the beaker. Now this lamp is going to be our light source. Then using an inverted funnel, tube and attached syringe, collect the volume of oxygen per time. This could be possibly 10 minutes. And then we can move the lamp further from the beaker to four more positions as a way of varying the light intensity and measure the volume of oxygen produced in the same time. Repeat the experiment at each varied light intensity and calculate the mean values. While experimenting, we can control the temperature using a water bath. We could add the same mass of sodium hydrogen carbonate to provide the same volume of carbon dioxide or same amount of carbon dioxide. And uh, after this, we need to record our results in a table with labels and units. We draw a scatter graph with labels and units and then use a suitable statistical test like Spearman's to establish significance of the results. In this experiment, the limitations are it is difficult to measure the volume of oxygen produced since some of it is going to dissolve in the water. And also the lab conditions may be different from actual conditions in nature and they could be misleading. I mean, the results we get could be misleading. The other thing is the surface of the leaves is going to be harder to control because they will have different surface area. So it's going to be harder for us to control. If experiments are repeated by another person, the results could be different due to the differences in the surface area of the leaves. Example two says investigate the respiratory quotient of germinating seeds. To answer this, the dependent variable is the volume of oxygen used per time. So we can set up experiments with a respirometer attached to a syringe and a capillary tube containing a colored solution. The seeds used should be of the same age, mass and species. In the respirometer, carbon dioxide can be absorbed using potassium hydroxide or you could say soda lime. This ensures accurate determination of the volume of oxygen used. Allow the seeds to respire for a certain period of time. Again, this depends on you. Refill the respirometer with oxygen to return the colored solution to its original position. Here, the volume of oxygen used to refill is going to equal to the volume of oxygen used in the respiration process. We need to repeat the experiment with our soda lime for the same period of time and recall the volume of air required to return the colored solution to its original position. The volume of carbon dioxide produced equals 
the difference between the volume of air required to refill with soda line minus the volume of air required to refill without soda line. Here we can calculate the respiratory quotient by dividing the volume of carbon dioxide produced by the volume of oxygen used. Also in this experiment, we need to allow seeds time to acclimatize and repeat the experiment with other seeds under similar conditions. You need to keep the temperature constant using an air conditioner and disinfect the seeds before use using a safe antimicrobial. This is to make sure that the microorganisms pre-existing on the seeds are not gonna respire as well and mess up the experimental results. Now in recording this data, we need to record the results in a table with labels and units. We need to draw a bar graph with labels and units and use a suitable statistical test like a student t-test to establish significance of the results. In this experiment, the limitations are it is difficult to control contamination from the seeds. Also returning the colored solution to its original position could cause some errors in the results. It is difficult to control all variables like pH, temperature, biological processes around germination and so on. And some seedlings could carry out anaerobic respiration during the experiment. Now we go to the last example, example three. Design an investigation to study the effect of plant extracts on bacterial growth. Here the dependent variable is the diameter of the zone of inhibition and the independent variable is the different extracts. We need to use aseptic conditions like sterile apparatus, gloves, wiping surfaces with alcohol and fleming to culture the microorganisms. Using a mortar and a pestle, crush the leaves and add a suitable solvent to extract the antimicrobial substances. The solvent added should be the same concentration and volume. We also need to prepare agar plates with suitable growth medium and inoculate them with bacteria. Then cut evenly sized filter paper discs and soak them into the antimicrobial extract for the same period of time. Using sterile forceps, place the filter paper discs onto the pre-inoculated agar plate and place them in an incubator at about 20 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Then after 24 hours, measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition around each disc using a ruler. In this experiment, we have to control temperature, control pH using a buffer, and also the number of crushed leaves should be the same. We need to repeat the experiment with each extract at the same conditions and calculate the mean. Again, the results are gonna be recorded in a table with labels and units, and we need to include a mains column. You need to draw a bar graph with labels and units and use a suitable statistical test like the student t-test to establish significance of the results. The limitations here are it's difficult to precisely measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition and there is a possibility for contamination from microorganisms present on the leaves. We cannot just use one type of microorganism to make a conclusion on if these antimicrobial extracts are efficient so we need to repeat the experiment with other microorganisms in order to establish if the results are significant. So this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.